May I have your attention, please? We are ready to start with the International Menopause Society webinar. And I welcome you all to this uh, uh, very, very interactive webinar which we are hosting through the International Menopause Society. I welcome our speakers, uh, Professor Rod Baber from Australia, uh, Dr. Chua from Singapore, our invited national speakers from India, Professor Jaideep Malhotra, Dr. Jyoti Uni, the moderators in the five Indian societies which are hosting this seminar. And uh, we also have the delegates who have joined us globally. So I welcome you all and I look forward to a very interesting two-hour <coughs> session that we will have discussing the impact of hormonal therapy on women's health. Professor Babu will speak to us on the WHI and its critical analysis, followed by a few questions which we will place to him. This will be followed by Professor Chua, who will speak to us on the impact of hormone therapy on bone health. And this again will be followed by a few questions with her. And this moderating will be done by me and then after these lectures are over, we have one more lecture with, uh, with Professor Rod Baber, who will speak on the uh, current recommendations of hormone therapy. So after these uh, lectures are over, we will throw it to open to the global audience and to the five cities in India, <coughs> moderators will be moderating the session. If you look at what's happening with the population, we know that all over the world, populations are getting older. And in 2015, if you see the darkest zone, which is suggestive of 30% or more population above 60 years of age, you'll find that the numbers are hardly many. I mean, there are very, very few countries, very few areas which are dark blue in color. But if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, left-hand side of your screen, you'll find that in 2050, there'll be a large number of countries which will be having an adult population of over 60 in women, uh, probably in, in mainly in North America and in China and very, very close to in Asia too. If you look at the time which has taken for populations to double their strength, if you see France in 1850 doubled its strength after 150 years in terms of there was a 10% adult population above 60 years, which after 150 years reached 20%. But if you see after the year 2000, the doubling is happening very, very rapidly. And in Japan and in China, you will see that, that in about, and Brazil, you will find that in 25 years, the percentage has gone from 10% to 20%. And in India, we are following very, not very far. The key facts known about women's health is that worldwide, women live an average four years longer than men. And in 2011, women's life expectancy at birth was more than 80 years in 46 countries, but only 58 years in the WHO African region. Almost 99% of maternal deaths every year occur in developing countries, whilst globally, cardiovascular disease, which is often thought to be a male problem, is a number one killer of women. Breast cancer is a leading cancer killer among women aged 20 to 59 years worldwide. And we know that this health in older women is not random. It totally is based on what is the genetic inheritance of that person, where she spent her whole lifetime, where she lives. It also depends on her health behavior through her whole uh, life. And it also depends on, uh, depends on what access she has to health care. And therefore, in developing regions, you will find, or in low-income countries, you will find, that women die more of lower respiratory tract infection, HIV, AIDS, and diarrhea, etc., mainly due to infections. But if you go into the high income countries, you'll find that more women die of ischemic heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer, stroke, etc. So it all depends on where you're born, where you live, etc. Based on that and what you inherit, 
will depend on what you will finally die of. WHO has taken this up as a priority area of action. And they've looked at various ways in which things need to improve over the world. And they have said that there has to be, we have to ensure that everyone can grow old in an age-friendly environment. We should improve the, uh, the measurement of monitoring and understanding. We should also align healthcare systems to the older population which they now serve and develop long-term care systems. Being healthcare providers, it is imperative for us to understand that we also are equally involved in the care of the older women. Our goal should be to maximize functional ability so that they can live a life of dignity post their 60 years. And at the same time, we must be investing in healthy aging, meaning that we create a future that gives older women the freedom to live lives that previous generations could never have imagined. We at the International Menopause Society are committed to improving the quality of lives of women as they mature. So as we go along, we, I would like to introduce our first speaker, the president of the International Menopause Society, Professor Rod Baber, who's a clinical professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Sydney Medical School, University of Sydney. He's also head of the Menopause and Menstrual Disorders Clinic at the Royal North Shore Hospital. Dr. Chua is the president of the Asia Pacific Menopause Federation in 2013 to 2017. She's also the director and specialist OBGYN at the Clinic for Women, Mount Albania Hospital, Singapore. She's an active member of the Association of Women Doctors in Singapore and the Osteoporosis Society of Singapore. Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra is the president of the Indian Menopause Society currently, and she's just been the immediate um, past president of Aspire, and she's done a great job during her tenure. She's also the vice president of the South Asia Federation of Menopause Societies, being the managing director of Rainbow Hospitals uh, in India. Dr. Jyoti Uni has been the president of the Indian Menopause Society, She's head of the department of OBGYN at Jahangir Hospital in Pune, and she's currently the representative of Indian Menopause Society to the Council of Accredited Menopause Societies of the International Menopause Society. Our other locations where we have the uh, Indian delegates seated are in Delhi, where the secretary, the chapter secretary is Dr. Basu, who will be moderating the event from there. We have Chennai um, uh, being represented by the Chapter Secretary, Dr. Hebziba, and she will moderate from Chennai. We have Dr. Jyoti Jaiswal from Raipur and Dr. Salini Jain from there. From Varodhra, we have Dr. Sushma Bakshi, and from Pune, we have Dr. Shubhada Jatar. These are the heads of the different chapters, uh, five cities in India, which are the very strong uh, representation at the Indian Menopause Society. The global audience can log on onto the link which has been mentioned above. Please log on to this link and join us in this interactive webinar which has been organized by the International Menopause Society and hosted by the Indian Menopause Society, supported through an educational grant by Pfizer. How you will ask your questions is definitely shown here, where there will be a question answer tab below the video box throughout the event. Link users just need to add their name, email ID, write the question and click submit. The questions will be received by me and the questions can be submitted anytime while the session is live. While the five cities in India can pass on their questions to their moderator, who will then ask the questions to the speakers. So I will first of all uh, invite Professor Rod Weber to give his talk on the WHI and its critical analysis. Professor Rod, may I request you to please start? Thanks very much, Daru. Um, thank you very much, Daru. And good evening to everybody, or good afternoon to everybody in India, uh, and to Dr. Chua in Singapore. I'm so glad you're all attending, and um, on behalf of IMS, I would certainly like to
thank the Indian Menopause Society and all my friends in India for the great effort they have made to make these things happen. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to talk to other people in the world, for an interaction to take place, and uh, as soon as my slides come up, I will talk to you. <clears throat> so I think we all know what the Women's Health Initiative is, but perhaps we don't know the detail. And what I want to do this afternoon is to talk to you about this trial, about its results, about how those results were first reported, and about how they've finally been concluded. Because it's important that we understand the process that's gone on. The Women's Health Initiative was commissioned by the National Institute of Health in the US in 1991 to address the most common causes of death, disability and impaired quality of life in postmenopausal women. There were three components. One was an observational study to identify predictors of disease. One was a study of community approaches to developing healthy behaviour. And the third was a randomised trial, which looked at three things. One was dietary interventions, one was calcium and vitamin D supplementation, and the third was hormone replacement therapy to prevent osteoporosis and heart disease. It's important to know that the primary aim of this study stated in the original planning papers was to see what happened to women who commenced HRT at an older age. At the very beginning of this process, the WHI investigators said, we know what happens to younger women when they use HRT, it's generally beneficial. We want to see what happens if we give it to older women. And so they did. In total, there were 161,808 women recruited for this study, of whom about 68,000 were involved in RCTs. This is the RCT that we all know, 27,000 women, all postmenopausal, about 10,000 who had had a hysterectomy, and a bit over 16,000 who had not. And those women were randomised to receive conjugated oestrogens alone if they'd had a hysterectomy, or conjugated oestrogens plus 2.5 milligrams of medroxyprogesterone if they had not had a hysterectomy. And they were matched with a group of women who were on placebo. The trial was stopped in 2002 due to what was described as adverse outcomes. And these are the results that were reported in 2002. And you can see the way I would describe this to you would be there were seven extra heart attacks which occurred amongst 10,000 women and there were eight extra strokes. There were eight extra breast cancer cases, although you'll see that that's not really statistically significant. There were 18 extra cases of thromboembolic events. There were six fewer colorectal cancers, almost cancelling out the increase in breast cancer. And there were five fewer hip fractures. There were a lot fewer vertebral fractures, but they weren't concluded. But this is how the report came out. There were 29% more heart attacks, 41% more strokes, and 26% more breast cancer. It was deliberately provocative. And subsequently, in an interview with Tara Parker Pope, who is a journalist with the Wall Street Journal in the USA, Jack Rousseau, who was the lead investigator, said to her, our aim was to go for high impact. Our goal was to shake up the medical establishment and change their thinking about hormones. So there was no intent to deliver a considered scientific message. It was all about being provocative. So there are a few problems with this. The first one is the data was released before it had been completely adjudicated. So the data hadn't been finalised. The data was released before review by all the principal investigators. In fact, when the investigators had their meeting, they were told by the principal investigator that the paper was written and was handed out for them to read. And when they complained, they were told that it was too late to make changes because it was already in print with JAMA. The data was released before publication of the journal, which meant that 
majority of doctors in the world were unable to read the paper and get any sense of what it really meant. The data was released for the entire cohort. It was not released in age groups as the original protocol said it should have been. But it was emphasised when those results were released that the results applied to all women irrespective of age, ethnicity or health status. And I want you to remember that as we work through this talk. Relative risks, not absolute risks, were emphasised and they are always a guaranteed way of confusing a patient. And most of all, for a study that cost $63 million to run, statistical rigour was not present. So let's have a look at follow-up to what WHI clinical trials and just see what we did find. This is the first report on cardiovascular disease. The effect of HRT on cardiovascular disease was the primary endpoint of the studies. And as I said earlier, it was acknowledged in the original paper that although there was substantial data which suggested a benefit of HRT on cardiovascular disease in younger women, the data on the effect of HRT on heart disease when started in older women was quite limited. The first release of that WHI data in July 2002 reported, as I said, an increased risk of heart disease irrespective of age, ethnicity or health status. The hazard ratio was 1.29. It was statistically significant and it amounted to seven extra cases per 10,000 per year. In 2004, the first results from the estrogen only arm were published and cardiovascular disease was not increased. The hazard ratio was 0.91, not statistically significant. Subsequently, there have been a number of publications looking at this issue. And let's work down the top one, two, three, four, five. They all relate to estrogen plus progestogen. And you can see that the first study was statistically significant. The second study was not. The third study was not. The fourth study was not. And when the final publication came in 2013, the hazard ratio was 1.18 and was not statistically significant. There was no increase in cardiovascular disease in the WHI for women using estrogen plus progestogen. Let's look at the four remaining ones. This is estrogen only. Hazard ratio in 2004.91, not significant. In 2006.95, the same. In 2007, not significant. <clears throat> and again, finally, in 2013, the hazard ratio was 0.94 and again, not significant. Again, no harm caused for women who used hormone therapy in the Women's Health Initiative. So a few more lessons learnt. Although that very bold first press statement said, 29% more heart attacks. Subsequent analyses of this data have repeatedly and consistently shown no significant increase of cardiovascular disease for users of either conjugated estrogens or conjugated estrogens plus MPA. There is, however, evidence which suggests that MPA may have attenuated some of those benefits that accrue due to estrogen use. What about the effect of age? They said at the original press conference the effects were regardless of age. This contrasts very much to what's been seen in prior observational studies and I just want to show you this, the data from the biggest of all, the Nurses Health Study. This study has gone um, for over 25 years now and it is very clear on this data after adjustment for age, BMI, lipids, hypertension, family history, diabetes, smoking, diet, education, alcohol and physical activity that women in their 50s actually have a reduced risk of coronary heart disease if they use hormone therapy and women in their 60s have no change. There's no harm done. This is quite in contrast to the data claimed to have been seen in the Women's Health Initiative. And the reason that we always questioned that original data was because Tom Cousin, who died last year, 
uh, reported on data from monkey models that very clearly showed there was a window of opportunity, a safe time when hormone therapy could be introduced. This is his monkey model, and you can see the yellow bar at the top. Uh, those monkeys were rendered surgically menopausal and were then treated immediately with estrogens plus an atherogenic diet. And when they were um, examined subsequently, there was a 70% reduction in the amount of plaque in their coronary vessels compared to the animals not given estrogen. The pink group in the middle had an atherogenic diet before they started and were then given estrogen plus more atherogenic diet. And their reduction was 50%, not quite as much. And that's obviously because the atherogenic diet that they had before they became menopausal did some damage to their vessels. And then in the dark pink at the bottom, these were the animals who had a healthy diet, but after their menopause were given an atherogenic diet and no hormones for about four and a half years. That's equivalent to about 12 to 15 years in women. And when those animals were examined subsequently, the effect of estrogen was zero. In other words, the opportunity, the window of opportunity had been missed. So in fact, Klassen said at the IMS World Congress in Berlin in 2002 in June that WHI would not show any benefit for hormones because the women were too old. And he was absolutely right. But if we look at the women in age groups, the story is completely different. This is the 2004 publication of release from the estrogen only arm, which shows a very clear effect of age. For women in their 50s, the risk ratio, the hazard ratio is 0.56, almost statistically significant. For women in their 60s, it was 0.92, not significant. And for women in their 70s, again, not significant, but trending towards harm. So there's a very obvious effect of age being seen here. And when we look at Jack Rousseau's publication in 2007, so this is the lead investigator. This is the man who said uh, the same for all age groups, no different. Well, if you look at this chart, then on the left, the bars on the left are women all, who used all forms of HRT. And you can see the very pale bar, which is below the black line, is for women who were within 10 years of their last period, and they have a reduced risk of heart disease. The pink in the middle is the women who were 10 to 19 years from their last period, and they have a trend to an increase which is not statistically significant. And if you look at the brown bar on the right in that first group, then that's the only group who had a significant increase in heart disease, and they were women who initiated hormone therapy more than 20 years after their last period. If you look at estrogen only, the effect is more marked. If you look at estrogen plus progestogen, it's obvious that the progestogen does attenuate some of the benefit of estrogen only therapy. So age of initiation and the addition of a progestogen will both influence cardiovascular outcomes. What about if we look at the 50 to 59 year olds? This is the estrogen and progestogen group. If you look at the top five lines, this is what happened during the intervention phase uh, where women received conjugated estrogens and medroxyprogesterone compared to placebo. Coronary heart disease, a trend to increase but not significant. Stroke, not significant. Pulmonary embolus, not significant. Mortality, not significant. And then below that, there's the long-term follow-up data published by Joanne Manson in 2013. Heart disease, not increased. Stroke, not increased. Pulmonary embolus, not increased. Mortality, not increased. For estrogen only, just the same, only better. No increase for heart disease, stroke, PE, or mortality during the intervention phase. And in the long-term follow-up, there is finally a statistically significant reduction in coronary heart disease for women who used estrogen alone if they started within that 10 years of their last menstrual period. No increase in anything else. And by the way, no increase in breast cancer for women aged 50 to 59 in either treatment arm. 
So more lessons learned. Despite those claims at the initial press conference, the age at initiation and the proximity to the last period do make a difference to some health outcomes. This is particularly true of cardiovascular disease and VTE risk. And as I just mentioned, women aged 50 to 59 did not have an increased risk of VTE or heart disease uh, when they were examined in WHI. For women using combined HRT, the addition of MPA appeared to attenuate, attenuate cardiovascular risk and so it's important that we can consider the progestogen when we're prescribing it for women. There will be other progestogens, notably uh, micronized progesterone or didrogesterone, which appear to be safer for cardiovascular health and also for the breast. Well, because I know Dr. Chua will speak about it, this is the WHI data, irrefutable evidence and has been from the very outset that hormone therapy is very effective in reducing the risk of fracture at the spine, at the hip and at other non-vertebral sites. And the data for this is probably more convincing than any data we have on other bone sparing agents. <clears throat> what about breast cancer? You see on the left the Premarin Plus Provera conjugated estrogen and MPA group which shows an increased risk, it was 1.25, and the, on the right, the estrogen alone group has a ratio 0.80, but not statistically significant. The initial press release said breast cancer was increased by 26%. There are two important messages here. Never use relative risks because people don't understand it. Use an absolute risk because this risk increase is the same as you would see with women who are obese, who didn't breastfeed, who didn't have children, or who consumed too much alcohol. Much easier to understand. And be careful with your statistics. The so-called 26% was actually not statistically significant. And if we look at the oestrogen and progestogen arm, the risk of breast cancer has never been significant. The first line shows us the original paper, the second line, the original paper using adjusted confidence intervals, which should have been used, and then versions 3, 4 and 5 subsequently. The only group that were shown to have a significant increase in risk were women who had previously used HRT. So for women who had never used HRT before they commenced it in the Women's Health Initiative trial, breast cancer risk was not increased. This is the oestrogen only group and as I showed you before, there's a trend to a decreased risk which did not achieve statistical significance. But with long term follow up, once again, after 11.8 years of follow up, the relative risk of breast cancer for women using oestrogen only in WHI was 0.77 and it was statistically significant. And the risk of breast cancer death was also reduced. And these figures are completely in line with data from observational studies. And this is the nurses study down the bottom here, which you can see shows no increase in risk of breast cancer for women who use oestrogen only for up to 20 years. So, to summarise, WHI was a well-designed, long-running RCT to test the hypothesis that HRT given to older postmenopausal women would reduce the burden of disease of ageing. Despite this, when the data was first released, the investigators said the findings applied to women of all ages and ethnicity. It is now clear that that is not true. The age of a woman and her number of years since her last period will both have an impact on how she reacts to hormone therapy. And clearly, menopausal hormone therapy is safest when it is initiated in women around the age of the menopause, 50 to 59, or within 10 years of their last period. And in those women, menopausal hormone therapy will alleviate vasomotor symptoms and will improve quality of life. It will improve bone density. It will reduce the incidence of osteoporotic fractures. If you use oestrogen only, it will reduce the risk of heart disease. And if you use combined therapy, it won't adversely affect heart disease risk. Oestrogen only hormone therapy has resulted in a reduced risk of breast cancer in long-term follow-up. And combined hormone therapy users showed no increase in breast cancer for at least the duration of the trial 
which was seven years. Menopausal hormone therapy in the 50 to 59 year olds did not increase VTE risk, although obviously that risk will be increased in older women. And remember above all, the primary indication for using hormone therapy is the alleviation of troublesome menopausal symptoms. Um, thank you very much and I can't finish without a plug for the World Congress on Menopause, which is not too far away now. Prague on the 28th of September, I hope you will join me there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rod. This was really excellent and brought out the fact very clearly that uh, the WHI study being such a, uh, uh, such a large study, unfortunately, uh, did not really uh, bring in the right subjects into the, uh, into the research which they conducted. The women were more than, I think the average age was 63 years in that study. <coughs> it was 63. 63 years. And we talk about women uh, in their uh, younger days having benefits out of uh, therapy. So data from the WHI, uh, the molecules which were used uh, were basically, uh, I think, conjugated equine estrogen and different progesterones. Does this also apply to other molecules uh, if you put the WHI into a kind of a comparative mode? Would you, do you think that if there was any other molecule used, it would have given you similar results? Uh, I think it's a great shame that other molecules were used because it would have been very useful for us. There's, there's, generally speaking, it's, it's believed that uh, estrogen is estrogen is estrogen, and, and at the moment, therefore, we're not aware of any particular benefit for conjugated estrogens compared to estradiol or vice versa. What we do know from large European studies is that if you use a different progestogen, then you will make a difference to the risk of breast cancer and you will make a difference to the risk of cardiovascular disease and particularly VTE. You'll also probably make a difference to the way the women feel because micronized progesterone and didrogesterone are usually much better tolerated. So um, I think, uh, you know, things change as different research studies come into play and uh, once we are more convinced about uh, the data we get from different studies, I think science evolves and we get more information. So if you had to look at the WHI study today and uh, after you have critically analyzed it, there were a lot of women who gave up using hormones overnight. When when it came into the media. Uh, the, the study was reported in the media even before it was published. And therefore, when an alarm signal went out and women stopped their hormone therapy overnight, and I understand that these women who have stopped the treatment have been followed for over a decade. And uh, could you share a little information on that as to what happened to those women when they stopped therapy? Um, yes, I can. I can. Um, what, uh, what has happened is most of those women have, of course, finally come off their hormone therapy and um, they've continued to prosper. But it's quite clear that a greater number of women, as time has gone on, who were not on hormone therapy have had adverse health outcomes, particularly in the estrogen only group. In that group, uh, the women who were on estrogen alone have had fewer cardiovascular events than the women on placebo um, and in a calculation based on likely use of hormone therapy before and after WHI, Philip Sorrell who's a professor of uh, medical education in the US calculated that most likely about 90,000 American women over that 10 year period have have died of heart disease because they were not allowed the opportunity to use hormone therapy. So the intent of the Women's Health Initiative investigators to cause trouble uh, should be really questioned because that's not our role as investigators. Our role as investigators is to tell the truth 
and then to try and work out how best to look after the health of women. And that's not how this study is being portrayed. A generation of women have been denied good health because of the um, misplaced ideas of a small number of people. But after this uh, data was, after this study was uh, critically analyzed, do you think the uh, physicians in your country are prescribing it more often or women are happy to use it now that so many years have passed and they have better and more positive information? Are they willing to take it now? What percentage of women are using hormone therapy in your country? Oh, well, it was about uh, 25 to 30 percent before WHI, and it's about 11 or 12 percent now. And my, I haven't got figures to back this up, but my impression is that just as a, a generation of women have missed out, a generation of doctors have missed out too. Um, and what I see, what I see is my my trainees know more than my young consultant colleagues because of the age difference and. And you, as you know, I'm sure, Joanne Manson herself wrote a commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine um, earlier in March, which said, people have misinterpreted the results of our study, WHI. Women are not being prescribed hormones who should be, and we need to educate doctors because doctors don't know how to prescribe it either. So we have a great task ahead of us to, uh, to get this message out. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Chua, what about in your country, in Singapore? What's happening with uh, the use of hormone therapy? Yeah, we have very few uses of hormone therapy as well. Um, out of about 80% of women who actually know about hormone therapy do not want to use them. So mm -hmm. that's just from our opinion polls that's been conducted a little, a, a couple of years ago. So that number has significantly dropped over the years since the publication of WHI. It was in our newspapers over here in Singapore as well. So our women read the bad news in the papers. And following that, the doctors are very reluctant to so spend the time to correct that misinterpretation. Um, and they maybe themselves have, have uh, misgivings about this and that's not accurately educated otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to those problems, um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have lost their licenses to continue to have these uh, therapies available on our shelves. So even if I wanted to prescribe a hormone therapy, I would be struggling to find a suitable one that is still in the market. So some of the medications that we had before are now not available to us. Okay. And what about in India? What do you think? Could you share your experience, Dr. Jaidi? And I feel like in India also is no uh, different from the world because the scare of uh, hormone therapy has been really on for a long, long time. So if we really want to now send the message across, I think we'll have to educate our practitioners and our doctors first. And that is what uh, Indian Menopause Society is now really working on so that that window of opportunity can be utilized and uh, we are prescribing more once we have more confidence. And Jyoti, Dr. Dr. Jyoti, what do you think uh, needs to be the strategy in India at the moment to help to revive the hormone? We were using quite a bit of hormone therapy earlier. But now, after the WHI, we also had an alert and alarm, and everyone stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find it very difficult to persuade our patients to take it, even though we are personally convinced about using it. So, you have any suggestions on what we could do? So, I would say yeah. that we have to educate the general practitioners, uh, is what I think, because what happens is that even if the specialist prescribes, some hormone therapy <coughs> and what's happening you just stop this because otherwise you are going to get breast cancer or you're going to have a heart attack so uh, I think we need to sort of do it two pronged besides the women we need to also educate not just the gynecologist but the GP and other physicians as well so, Rod, do you think the International Menopause Society could help uh, 
the other societies in the world the ones which are with camps we are going back to australia um i think we are going to go back and forth between three different countries <laughs> so in australia or uh, uh, through the international menopause society do you think there's anything we can do to improve the use of hormone therapy amongst our uh, first of all to make our doctors write it more or for our patients to use it more any any experiences from your country that you could share with the other regions of the world um well the only the only solution is as everybody else has said education i might just tell you this week i saw a patient of mine who's a rheumatologist and i delivered her children and she's now menopausal and she came along and said my hot flushes are terrible and i told women for years that there's nothing wrong with hot flushes and what are they worried about and now she's got them and she came to see me because her daughter is a medical student and went mm-hmm. to a menopause clinic and said mum all these women come in saying give me some hormones quick because they're dying of heat uh, so i do i go back to the generation thing i think <laughs> we've got to get the word out somehow the australian mm-hmm. menopause the australasian menopause society tries to get out and do regional meetings within Australia. You know, Australia is a great brown land and everybody lives on the fringe. But there's a number of people who still live in the country and so we do try to get out and educate them as well. I think that's all you can do, constant education. Constant education, that's the right word. As a matter of fact, yes. Yeah, so you, sorry, do you think that, you know, the problem started with the media? Do you think that the media should correct the problem? <laughs> if only they would if only they would well would there be pressures from our societies to sort of like force the message through do you think yeah i think if we can make enough noise they will listen to us um yeah i remember when when the who estrogen only data came out and it was all good news about heart disease and breast cancer That's we right. in australia we all thought, we thought the press won't be interested because it's too good and the press were interested but they were only interested because they could write a story about how bad the WHO investigators were so once again the emphasis was on the emphasis was on lousy research rather than what what's important for women so yeah we should be able to do something <clears throat> okay thank you so much uh, rod for your talk and this interaction and i i will now invite uh, professor chua from singapore to give her talk on the impact of hormone replacement therapy on bone health so dr chua can you please start with your presentation are you guys seeing my slide yep can you not have you put it put it on on your laptop yes okay so i'll start Um we're talking about the impact of hormone therapy on bone health. I think everybody in the audience um know about osteoporosis. I'm very happy that there's such a big group of people from the Ind- Indian Menopause Society that's present today. Um osteoporosis um involves not just bone density but also bone quality and the end result is it affects bone strength and therefore it changes the risk of fracture when our bone strength change. Now, the lecture today centers around hormone therapy and I just want to mention that hormone therapy used to be once upon a time the only FDA approved treatment option for osteoporosis and fracture prevention. Um over the so many years, so many different studies like WHI, uh her study, the wisdom study, they've all um sort of shown that hormone therapy decreases fragility fractures and that decrease is in the region of 20 to 35%. But since the publication of WHI as we have all been discussing, there is a general reluctance to use hormone therapy favoring other treatment options for osteoporosis and fracture prevention. It is important to consider HT as still a relevant and viable treatment option for osteoporosis prevention and treatment. Uh and this is especially true in the early menopause age group. Now, osteoporosis is a leading healthcare problem. Uh there are 9 million fractures annually. There's one osteoporotic fracture every 3 seconds, which is shorter than the time that I take to finish this sentence. 
33 million women are affected in the Western world and 200 million women worldwide. One in three women over 50 will experience osteoporotic fracture, and this is more than for the men. And women have a lifetime fracture risk of 40 to 50 percent. Most fractures do occur in the postmenopausal women, and the incidence of this, note that, it is exceeding that of breast, endometrial, and ovarian cancers combined. In women over 45 years of age, osteoporosis accounts for more days spent in hospital than many other diseases, including diabetes, myocardial infarction, and breast cancers. In Asia, where I'm practicing, and a lot of the audience today is, about 50% of osteoporotic fractures, hip fractures, are projected to occur in our part of the world. This is by the year 2015. Big part of this is because we are particularly an aging population, uh, and a lot of our women are going to be above 50. A, a lot of the population is going to be above 50. It is largely still underdiagnosed and undertreated. The DEXA, which is one means to treat, uh, one means to diagnose osteoporosis, is relatively still expensive and it's not widely available in most developing Asian countries. Many developing countries, like for example in Indonesia, in Vietnam, it's found that the DEXA machines are less than 0.001 per 10,000 population. And even for the few machines that are available, they are usually centered in the, in the capital, in the big cities, and none for all the other areas. And this is far below the recommended number in, in Europe, for example, of 0.11 per, uh, per 10,000. Nearly all Asian countries fall far below the WHO recommendations for calcium intake. We have a, an average 400 milligrams per day, which is far short uh, from the 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams a day that's recommended for daily intake. And countries in South and Southeast Asia shows widespread prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. In Singapore, where I am, our number of osteoporotic fractures have increased five times in the last 30 years. There is now 450 cases per 100,000 population in women over the age of 50. This is sevenfold more than that of breast cancer in my country, more than 35-fold more than ovarian cancers, and 30-fold more than uterine cancers. And it is five-fold more than all of those three uh, women cancers combined. So what happens when a woman in Singapore gets a hip fracture? Well, 6% will die soon after admission. 26% of patients will die within a year of the fracture. Amongst the survivors, only about a quarter will be able to ambulate without aid. This is a very serious problem. I know that women are worried about breast cancers and heart disease, but hip fractures kill and people need to know that. We know that, you know, the osteoporosis starts with what you do since childhood. It's a pediatric disease with a geriatric outcome. The years that we deposit bones is important. We need to educate the young ones to have enough calcium, to move about enough, not to be sedentary, not to have other risk factors. Following menopause, there is a period of rapid loss, and that's when the bones start to lose density and then bone strength. The recent studies show that this loss is not just post-menopause. As early as two years before menopause, there is already significant bone loss. This is true for those with BMI that is more than 30, as well as those with BMI that's less than 30. And it is true for both spine, BMD, as well as the neck of, uh, neck of femur, BMD. So 50% of all our lifetime total bone loss occurs at this time of life, in the late perimenopause, as well as the early menopause the most rapid bone loss is going to be at this time. It is too late if we wait for women who have already had multiple hip fractures, spine fractures, who are already wheelchair bound to talk about osteoporosis. We need to treat them, we need to find them early, and we need to treat them. Even with the, just a medical history, it is possible to identify those who are at risk. So the risk factors for osteoporosis include aging, the women population, Caucasian and Asian are particularly at risk of osteoporosis. Early menopause is a risk factor. Family history of osteoporosis, having a grandmother who is hunched over, who has the dowager hump, who has history of uh, a variety of fractures, thin frame, and then those 
um, factors which are sort of our responsibility, so to speak. Those that we can change include the smoking and drinking habits, dietary choices, including calcium and vitamin D, exercise and physical activities, and certain medications that may increase bone loss. So just using a history, the IOF has a one-minute osteoporosis risk test. It tells us what our risk is of having osteoporosis. Just finding out that we are shrinking, you know, losing our height might be an indicator that osteoporosis is there. And Singap one of the Singaporean doctors have actually um, sort of uh, designed this osteoporosis self-assessment tool for Asians. It is a very, very simplistic tool. Just using the age and weight, we can see that those women who have smaller frame, who therefore weigh less, will have reached osteoporotic risk at a much earlier stage of life compared to those who are heavier. So this is one way of a sort of, I always tell patients, this is your one benefit of being heavier, but this doesn't give you the allowance to just sort of eat more and get fat. But with, when you have a heaviness, it implies that you have a bigger frame. And with a bigger frame, perhaps bigger caliber bones. And a simplified tool, um, like just using the H minus weight, can help you decide whether you're sort of at risk and therefore needing a bone mineral densitometry test or whether you can, you can wait because the risk is still low. There's also the Sheffield University designed uh, FREX um, tool, which you can download from, from the internet, uh, who can, which can help you assess your 10-year probability of fracture. And this is country dependent, and many Asian countries already are reflected uh, on the FRAX design. So it guides your decision to treat when you key in all the risk factors as well as your DMD. And of course, the bone mineral densitometry gives you a direct assessment of bone density and therefore a risk, a, a definition of osteoporosis where the T score is less than minus 2.5. So we've all done this for our patients. The BMD for spine as well as hip is reflective because it gives us the, uh, something that we can correlate across the board. It also gives us an idea what the, fra the fracture risk is um, because spine and hip fractures are the most devastating. There are also newer ways to diagnosis. Firstly, uh, to decide whether you're a quick loser of bones using biochemical markers. But in many countries, including Singapore, these markers are quite expensive to test and it may not be so realistic to have uh, testing for most patients in terms of doing these blood tests. Now, we've heard uh, Prof. Weber talk about the WHI. It is, it is very clear from this, including other health studies, that um, hormone therapy is useful for osteoporosis prevention, for fracture prevention. Now, the global index that decided that um, hormone therapy should stop in, in the study, the global index, was reported as unfavorable for HT. Um, but in this de decision for the global index, they included only hip fractures and not all the other osteoporotic fractures. If you include all the other osteoporotic fractures, the global index would actually become favorable. And this is one of the reasons why WHI turned out to give uh, negative results, negative news. Even for the estrogen-only arm, there were very clearly uh, protective effects against osteoporosis and fracture. Now, we, Duru, you were asking about what happens to the women after WHI, where they followed up. What happens in terms of osteoporosis is this. In the longitudinal observational study, the 80,000 postmenopausal women using HT since 2002, they were followed up and all their anti-osteoporotic medication used the occurrence of hip fractures. All these data were collected and the electronic, uh, on the electronic medical record system. Now, BMD was assessed in 54,000 of these women once during the uh, study period using DEXA machines. After six and a half years of follow-up, H-Race adjusted Cox proportional hazard model showed that Women who discontinued HT had greater risk of hip fracture compared to those who continued the use of hormone therapy. And the hip fracture risk increased as early as two years after stopping the hormone therapy. And the risk incrementally increased with longer duration of cessation. The longer duration of hormone therapy stopping was linearly correlated with lower bone mineral density. So 
currently the um, uh, the the British National Osteoporosis Society position statement states that hormone therapy significantly decreased the number of fractures at hip and spine compared to placebo. Even very low dosage is effective. The effects of hormone therapy after treatment cessation is controversial, but some evidence shows that um, it offers a little bit of protection for several years after treatment is stopped, while other evidence shows that the, protective, the protection is only temporary while it is being taken. The women with early menopause is the, the group of women that we should be particularly careful of because, as you know from the risk factors, these are the women who are particularly at risk of osteoporosis. And the recommendation is that they should take hormone therapy up to the age of normal menopause. And these women uh, maintain estrogen at normal levels up to the age of natural menopause. It is thought that this at this age, the risk associated with hormone therapy is negligible, as Prof. Babler has already shown. Now, for the British Menopause Society Council, uh, Joan Picken has, uh, has written that estrogen-based therapy is the mainstay of treatment for women with uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. It is recommended until the average age of natural menopause. And for this sort of usage, um, it is, there is no evidence to show that it actually increases the risk of breast cancer. We know that breast cancer increases risk with the number of years of exposure to hormones. So if you menopause at 50 and then you use hormone therapy for 10 years, those effects are very different from a girl who menopauses at 40 and then use hormone therapy for 10 years. So for these women with premature ovarian insufficiency, it is definitely recommended that estrogen replacement is there or hormone replacement is there until their natural age. So similarly, in the global consensus statement, and we're about to update this again, but the 2013 global consensus statement suggests that hormone therapy is effective and appropriate for prevention of osteoporosis-related fractures. Uh, again, we do weigh this against all the other risks and benefits, the risk and benefit ratio for each individual woman, but Certainly, it is indicated for women who need hormone therapy, and it is good to start them uh, before 60 or within 10 years of menopause. And particularly for those with premature ovarian insufficiency, systemic hormone therapy is still recommended until the age of menopause. Now, looking at the profile of women at risk of, of breast cancer, and I mean, in my, in my work, when we, when we talk about hormone therapy to women, their major sort of antenna going up is that, you know, the breast cancer risk will go up. I don't want to get breast cancer. I don't want to be on hormone therapy. But if you look at that woman and you assess the risk benefit profile, you know that that woman who is at risk of breast cancer has a genetic predisposition. The whites are more um, at risk than the African American and Asian Hispanics have lower risk. Early menarche, late menopause, longer lifetime exposure to estrogen and progesterone, this gives a higher risk. If a woman has not had pregnancy or the pregnancy is after 30, the women who are younger and more pregnancy have reduced risk. Excessive alcohol intake, smoking, and then there are some studies who suggest that obesity and high fat diet increases the risk of breast cancer. Now, contradict this to that of the risk of osteoporosis, you will realize that Asians are at higher risk of osteoporosis. The early menarche and late menopause, which increases a woman's risk of breast cancer, is not true for osteoporosis. In fact, the earlier the menopause starts, or the earlier the ovarian um, effects is no longer there, the higher the risk of osteoporosis. Now, we know that in Asia, also certainly in Singapore, a lot of our women are starting pregnancy very late. And so, you know, if they start pregnancy at an age and where they have lost the ability to build bones, and yet during pregnancies, if they do not supplement calcium, they do not have enough calcium intake, they are actually going to start losing bones even during pregnancy, losing calcium from their bone structures. And so for them, the risk of osteoporosis is higher. So the more pregnancies they have at an older age group, the higher the risk of osteoporosis they will have. And as opposed to the risk of breast cancer where obesity and high fat diet is concerned, for osteoporosis, it's actually those who are very skinny, who are very thin frame that are at risk. 
So it's not difficult if we individualize our patients to know that which are the patients who have actually higher risk of osteoporosis. And we can then discuss with them and uh, impress upon them that actually their risk of breast cancer may not be as worrying to them as that, uh, that risk of osteoporosis should be. Well, in the ideal world, our women should be counseled to have adequate calcium intake uh, when they are pregnant. Our babies should be well made even you know, in the womb. We should have babies who are born healthy with good weight, with good bone structures. We should make sure that they have enough ad uh, milk intake with calcium intake through life. And herein lies another problem in Asia because a lot of Asians are lactose intolerant. We need to give them enough alternative for enough calcium intake. We need to make sure that our kids get off their butt and not sit in front of TV and eat junk food, that they're out running around. And we want to unfortunately say that in Asia, we don't have a lot of sun worshippers. In Asia, actually, most of our women, when they go to the beach, they are very, very adequately clothed. So they are actually averse to sun. They don't have enough uh, vitamin D, in fact. And it is important also to impress upon our women to actually work on their sense of balance, to have a good breast reflex when they exercise so that they have less fall risk. So at the end of the day, we do have a lot of other options for treatment of osteoporosis, but I certainly want to stress that hormone therapy is still a very viable option. It doesn't only treat osteoporosis, it is a prevention method. And for the younger mothers, or for the younger women, women particularly, have reached menopause early, we want to make sure that their bones are well taken care of, and we may want to consider for that matter starting hormone therapy for them. And as Prof. Weber did a little advertisement for the World Congress, can I also do a little advertisement here? I'd like to invite everybody to Singapore for the 6th Asia Pacific Menopause Federation uh, scientific meeting. This will be next April 21st to 23rd in a very historical Fort Canning. So thank you very much. I hope to see all of you in Singapore. That talk was really brilliant, and I'm sure you're uh, ready to ask a few questions, uh, uh, answer a few questions. The first question I'd like to ask you is that uh, keeping in mind that uh, hormone therapy has so much of a benefit as compared to the risk for treatment of osteoporosis, especially in women where, where the risk is low, would you also consider giving it as a preventive measure for osteoporosis? I certainly do in women who, uh, particularly in women who have uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. I think that's the big group of women that I have no doubt I will definitely strongly recommend hormone treatment. Um, for the women who reach menopause at a very normal age in Singapore, is about 51. So for the, that group of patients, I do give hormone therapy only for the purpose of treating symptoms. So not as a routine for disease prevention. So, and then when you do use hormone therapy uh, for uh, osteoporosis, is there any particular molecule you select for as a progesterone? Which one do you think there's any one particular progesterone? Uh, which I is agree. Well, I agree with Prof. Weber. Uh, there are some suggestions that micronized progesterone is, is a safer option. So my choices are towards the safer progesterone as well. But Progesterone is, is, is still a little bit of a mystery. There isn't enough study uh, sort of research on those, uh, uh, those options and to really identify without doubt which ones we should just be picking rather than having those, uh, all of them as options. But there are certain suggestions that micronized progesterone is the way to go. And what is the dose of the micronized progesterone you would use for osteoporosis? You mean for, for which category of women? Say for women who have got, say, premature ovarian failure and you want well, to give hormone therapy, uh, what kind of hormone therapy would you use for such women? Actually, Duru, for the 40-year-old woman who has reached menopause, um, I tend to suggest to them to use uh, oral contraceptive pills. Um, in this sort of group of women, certainly we have very low dosage oral contraceptive pills that are now available. They are indicated for use for the 40 to 50 age group. 
Um, I find that one, one reason for using the oral contraceptive pills, particularly for those women, is that they, they, don't, they don't have the, the sort of label that you've reached menopause. Um, it's an emotional decision as well. I find that women who are given the options to say that, well, a lot of women your age are also on oral contraceptive pills just for birth control. And if I put you on this, by the way, the hormones are going to benefit your bones and it's not going to give you the higher risk of osteoporosis uh, later on in life, that it's a lot easier to accept. And even for these uh, women, they still remember the WHI scare. They still think that hormone therapy in general is a bad idea. So, well, I'm being sneaky about it. I sell it another way. I do suggest that they go on oral contraceptive pills instead. Yeah, but unfortunately, in our country, even use of oral contraceptives is like, a, as soon as you talk about using oral contraceptives, women don't want to take it. So it's, oh, a, it's, right. it's a very funny situation because anything dealing with hormone is almost like a bad word. Uh, they would use the pill for, uh, you know, for their acne probably. But if you ask them to use it as a contraceptive, they would refuse to use it. So the number of women who are using oral contraceptives is much less than what I think would be in the Western world. And therefore, women at 40 to 50, uh, using oral contraceptives somehow is, a, is an option which uh, is not very easily going to be acceptable in our country. Oh. Um, Okay. Uh, that's unfortunately that's, the fact. That's and, not quite uh, the same in Singapore, actually. Our, our women uptake of oral contraceptive pills is quite high. That's generally quite an acceptable option. Um, I did spend time to discuss uh, the slight difference between uh, the studies that show oral contraceptive pills versus those that are different in, in the hormone replacement therapy category. Um, so I, I don't find that there's a uh, difficulty in uptake. I don't know how uh, Rod feels in Sydney. Is that is that also a difficult situation? So Rod is in Sydney. No. Uh, Rod, what do you think uh, in your country? Can we go to Sydney, please? I'm here. I'm here. Uh, look, we, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Chu. I think the, the pill is a reasonably good option. I, look, only last week I saw a young woman with POI, and she had been given a prescription by her GP for some um, HRT. And when she took it to the pharmacist, the pharmacist said, oh, that's very strange. So she immediately yeah. put it in a drawer and didn't use it, just didn't use it. So the pill's the solution. You see, about 30, a bit over 30% of Australian women still use the oral contraceptive as their primary form of contraception. So it's well established. And I think for younger women, in our society, it's easy because if their friends see a packet of the pill in their handbag, it's just sort of normal. Whereas if they see what really would be right. the old lady's hormones, it's much more difficult. Hmm. Oh. Uh, thank you, Rod. I think uh, we'll uh, go ahead with... Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chua, for your wonderful talk. And I'll thank request Dr. Uh, Professor Rod to give his next presentation, following which we'll throw open the questions to everyone in the audience and uh, we'll take questions from everyone. So, uh, Rod, uh, may I request you to speak on the current recommendations of, on menopausal hormone therapy. So we'll go back to... Um, okay. Can we have the presentation, please? Can you see it now? Uh, not yet. Just a second, sir. I'm doing it. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, let me Ooh. say that I'll be in Singapore. Yes. For APMF. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yes. yes, we're looking forward to having you. Ah, and, good. And Duru, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All of us are looking forward to Prague and then to Singapore. And we've got Sunila Khandelwal, who's our representative to APMF, who's been very active asking questions, I think, till uh, Rod's uh, presentation comes up. She's asking for in situ.
with non availability of transdermal hormone therapy what could be the best oral hormone therapy in women at high risk of venous thromboembolism uh my answer to that would be a non oral estrogen so a gel or a cream uh so it's not available the cream is not available it's nothing in that in that case i would say there are two potential options one would be a low dose micro um and if tibolone was available that would be the other option i would consider because tibolone in all of the randomized trials has not been shown to increase dte risk okay so we have a situation where you could if uh, uh, transdermal is not available you would recommend uh, we didn't get that first sentence which you said rod your voice uh, broke off before the tibolone what did you suggest uh, before the tibolone i uh, distracted cuz it's my computer but anyway i i said before the tibolone would be to use a low dose estradiol only okay combined with either micronized progesterone or dihydrogesterone and that would minimize the VTE. Okay, all right. So we got that answer. Uh the the other question was that um, is there any data on the safety of uh, newer uh, T-sex regarding their use in breast cancer women who have vasomotor symptoms? Uh any data is available Available on availability of new T sex. Um, We still don't have it in our country, but uh, uh, yeah. that uh, the only data we have on women is data which shows that the T sex uh, does not increase mammographic density. Um, the, we have animal data which shows in rodent models the T sex. does not allow terminal bud development and inhibits lobular gland development so theoretically it should be a safer option so first question is to you only madam from one of a senior doctor from the raipur she said conveyed uh, her hello to you and she is saying that we have been following you since decades you have maintained yourself so well do you believe in hrt and if yes which molecule <laughs> yes uh, the answer is yes uh, to hrt and um, i don't think i should be endorsing any product here this is an educational seminar and hence i will not reveal the name of the brand uh, we do not bomb on the name of the brand but just the name of the molecule but then that would give away the brand sir <laughs> <laughs> the slides are working again Oh great can, uh, Rod you can okay. carry on Let's go Is it only or with progesterone <laughs> Sorry What did you say Estrogen only or with progesterone I I have my uterus intact so I'm not using <laughs> any estrogen <laughs> So Rod can can you start your talk please Rod Yeah Back to Sydney please Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We have to get you on the screen still. Sydney, please. Diagnosis of menopause. We all know that. Defined as the last period. It's a retrospective diagnosis from our clinical point of view. It's a natural and inevitable event. If it occurs before the age of forty, we should regard it as premature, and then it becomes not more at a disease state. and the gold standard for staging of reproductive aging were of course a staging of straw plus 10 word which make it very for anybody working their way through it uh, where we are and you can see the menopause transition the perimenopause and early and late postmenopause all highlighted in yellow below Uh, now a few points about the menopause first of all with regard to weight gain an absolute increase in weight at midlife is not attributable to the menopause the hormone changes that accompany the menopause are associated with an increase in total body fat healthy diet 
importance of America, of Egypt, and the importance of physical activity uh, are all important factors in weight, weight management. And menopausal abdominal fat accumulation is in fact lessened by estrogen therapy with a reduction in overall fat mass, an improvement in insulin sensitivity, and a lower rate of type 2 diabetes. So hormones don't make you fat. The menopause doesn't make you fat, but fat distribution changes. Um, we advocate regular exercise to reduce cardiovascular disease. It should be at least 150 minutes a week. Uh, although obviously the intensity of the a white ten percent sufficient to any abnormalities associated with metabolic syndrome. People shouldn't smoke, of course, and lifestyle modifications are all helpful, uh, including socialising and just being physically and mentally active. A healthy diet should include several serves of fruit and fibre per day, whole grain fibres, fish twice a week, and low total fat. And of course, salt and alcohol consumption should also be limited. Premature ovarian failure is different. POI is primary hypogonadism in women younger than 40. It's confirmed diagnosis by an FSH greater than 40 or whatever your laboratory says is the menopausal level on two occasions, six weeks apart. And it needs to be effectively treated to prevent an increase in cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, as Dr. Chua has said, cognitive decline, dementia and Parkinsonism. So investigations into this diagnosis should include a hormone analysis, an autoimmune screen, um, carrier typing, fragile X premutation testing, and a pelvic ultrasound. It's terribly important that this diagnosis is conveyed in a sensitive and caring manner because it will be a shocking diagnosis for most young women. They should be provided with adequate information and the opportunity for proper counselling. And as we've all already said, the mainstay of treatment is menopausal hormone therapy and perhaps testosterone. As we've also said, treatment should be continued at least until the age of the natural menopause. If we do that, we will ameliorate, reduce the risk of the diseases associated with this condition I've already mentioned. And as far as pregnancy is concerned, the only proven effective treatment is oocyte or embryo donation. But it is important to remember that women with POI may spontaneously about 50% of women with idiopathic POI as a diagnosis will at some stage have another 5 to 10% of them may conceive. So it's important particularly women who may be 38 when this diagnosis is made and have four kids because they probably don't want to have a uh, as well. So it's a very important issue to discuss. <clears throat> a few points about urogynecology. Um, it's, it's first to say that vaginal dryness and soreness, pain with sex, urinary frequency, uh, nocturia and urgency are extremely common in postmenopausal women. There's a wide variation in the symptoms and, and signs of urogenital ageing. And in general, urogenital symptoms respond well to estrogen, but long-term treatments required. You can't give this stuff for a few weeks and expect it to last forever. If you use topical estrogen, and we would recommend for this, these conditions that you do, then the systemic risks reported with uh, any duration of systemic are not true estrogens used finally. It's also important to note that systemic hormone therapy does not prevent urinary incontinence and is not preferable to topical estrogen therapy in the management of these symptoms. Um, lifestyle changes and bladder training are recommended as first-line therapy for women with overactive bladder symptoms. Uh, there is a place for anti-muscarinic drugs, sometimes plus local estrogens. 
and this well service festival and treatment in women with overactive bladders. All women with urinary stress incontinence will benefit from pelvic floor training and physiotherapy as a first as a first As before, real surgery. I wish the retropubic and transobturated tapes are the most popular procedures. And generally speaking, there's no role for systemic estrogen therapy in women with pure stress urinary incontinence. It does not ever enable to demonstrate. But this is what the recommendations say uh, that it's a little characterised by diminished with an increased risk of fracture when you fall in your own body height. It's defined as a score of minus 2.5 or the presence of fragility fracture. An individual's 10-year risk can be estimated using any number of risk calculations. And I would endorse the use of OSTER. It's a very useful and sensible model to have. But FRAX does also contain information for a number of different ethnic groups. Um, intervention thresholds probability, but they should be country specific and tailored to each country needs and available facilities. But generally speaking, treatment should be patients with a fragility P score of worse than minus 2.5. Uh, as far as heart disease is concerned, I've harped on this already, but in women under age 60, or recently postmenopause cardiovascular disease, the initiation of estrogen alone reduces heart disease and all mortality. Age and daily can combine and this in particular refers of course to the progesterone or diderone. A recent meta-analysis and WHI 13-year follow all show a consistent hormone uses, but also we do not recommend initiating hormone therapy in women who are older than 60 years of age for any age for the primary prevention of heart disease. As far as venous thromboembolism is concerned, we should take a careful history to establish whether there is a personal or family history of VTE before we prescribe hormone therapy. Oral estrogen is contraindicated in women who have a personal history of VTE. And we just touched on that in the time. And thermal estrogen should be the first choice of estrogens in women who are awake because the risk of TE is significantly increased. VTE risk increases with age. And it increases with thrombophilias. <clears throat> As we've said before, the risk of VTE increases with oral hormone therapy, but that risk is very low before age 60. Observational studies and biological plausibility point to a lower or even non-existent risk with low-dose transdermal therapy. And as I've just mentioned, some progestins also be associated with a greater VTE risk. Medroxyprogesterone and norethisterone. Important to note, particularly in this context, that the incidence is a problem amongst Asian women. So the population screening for thrombophilia is not indicated prior to hormone therapy. The only indication would be if that woman had a personal history. Cognitive function. Menopausal hormone therapy should not be used to en enhance cognitive function. Uh, healthy women who are considering hormone therapy for vasomotor symptoms should not be concerned that hormones adversely affect cognitive function. And estrogen therapy may be of short-term benefit to surgically menopausal women. And that data particularly comes from data from look at, looking at uh, early menstrual women. Broadly speaking, data we have shows that hormones used around the time of the menopause have a beneficial effect on some aspects. 
Dann ist es um, hormone therapy. In the older women, say in their 70s, probably has on cognitive function and Alzheimer's disease. Pardon me. A few other things about other neurological conditions. Um, findings are really inconsistent as to whether hormone therapy improves or has no effect on depressive symptoms in younger postmenopausal women who are not depressed. Short-term therapy may improve depressive symptoms which arise during menopause transition and probably will increase the their being into remission sooner. Uh, hormone therapy may increase seizure frequency in women with epilepsy and it's important to note that before you initiate therapy. Hormone therapy is not, not associated with Parkinson's disease risk, but in women who have a surgical premature menopause, Parkinson's disease may be increased and that increased risk will be offset by estrogen replacement. And finally, the effect of hormone therapy on migraine headache and MS is largely unknown. And so it's the thing we've all discussed earlier this evening and everybody uh, agrees the thing that terrifies them the most. The possible increased risk of breast cancer associated with hormone therapy is primarily associated with the addition of a synthetic progestogen to estrogen only therapy and also risk may be lower with micronized progesterone or didrogesterone is small goes away rapidly over a few years when treatment stops. There is lack of safety data to support the use of hormone therapy in breast cancer survivors and obviously breast cancer risk should be evaluated before initiating therapy with hormones. <clears throat> um, endometrial safety. Firstly, we should regard any postmenopausal bleeding as cancer until it's proven otherwise. Um, about 1 to 14 percent of women with postmenopausal bleeding will in fact have endometrial cancer, so the vast majority will have benign disease, polyps or atrophy. Unopposed estrogen therapy is associated with a dose and duration related increased risk of endometrial cancer. Endometrial protection uh, is required and if in any woman who has a uterus and that requires an adequate dose and duration of progestogen. And generally speaking, that is 10 to 14 days a month or continuous therapy. For women who choose to use micronized progesterone, which was a question you raised earlier, Duru, we believe that for average doses of hormone therapy, 100 milligrams a day, 14 days per dose. Higher doses may be women using higher doses of estrogen, or for women who are overweight. And finally, investigation has there are a number of which could include ultrasound, where endometrial thickness is measured, uh, blind endometrial sampling. Um, Vessel thickening, if it's focal thinning, or if you are an adult in an sample or get an inadequate sample, then we need to do a hysteroscopy and DNC. Um, a few points on colorectal cancer. Observational studies have shown a reduced risk of colorectal cancer amongst users of oral hormone therapy and three meta-analyses have re reported the same reduced risk. In WHI, there was no effect of estrogen-only therapy and there was a reduced risk of colorectal cancer with combined therapy. Uh, there's limited data on the effect of on colorectal cancer risk and one randomized trial in older osteoporotic women used Tivolone also reported a reduced risk of colorectal cancer. But we don't know the uh, mechanism by which this reduced risk may occur. And for that reason alone, women should not be prescribed hormone therapy for the prevention of colorectal cancer. 
Um, neither long-term cohort studies or RCTs have found any increased risk of cervical cancer. With the association between hormone therapy and ovarian cancer remains unclear, but if there is any association, it is of a very low, very, very low increased risk with long-term use. In the Women's Health Initiative, neither estrogen or estrogen plus progestin showed an increased risk in lung cancer incidence. There's no association between hormone therapy and hepatocellular cancer, um, and it may be associated with a reduced risk of gastric cancer. <clears throat> a bit about androgens. Androgen levels decline with age in women, but they don't decline after the menopause. They actually stop the menopause. There is strong evidence that androgens influence female sexual function. It may be useful for women with arousal or desire disorders. Women need to be fully assessed for other treatable causes of sexual dysfunction before androgen therapy should be considered, and testosterone therapy always should be considered as a clinical trial. And if your patient has not experienced benefit within six months, it should be discontinued. Um, VVA, now the Americans call this GSM, and GSM may include VA, but vulva vaginal atrophy uh, is what estrogen works for. A few of the key points are be proactive. If you don't ask your patients about this, they won't tell you. So please ask your patients and encourage them to talk to you about their problems. VVA is the sole symptom. Local estrogen is the preferred methodology. Principles of treatment are rest and alleviation of symptoms, and treatments best started early and as I said earlier, and serum estrogen levels with other treatments are not above all range postmenopausal women. Additional progestogens are not required, and there's limited data on the use of topical estrogens in women with hormone-dependent cancers. I have one patient who's, uh, who's quite famous in Australia and one oncologist told her she couldn't use the oestrogen I prescribed so she changed oncologists and the second one told her it was okay. I rest my, my case. There are some women, however, who can't take oestrogens and for them, as you know, there are some SSRIs and SNRIs which offer some benefit in reducing vasomotor symptoms. Uh, if you choose to use paroxetine, you must make sure your patient is not on tamoxifen because it will interfere with the efficacy of tamoxifen. Other options include gabapentin, which is quite effective in reducing vasomotor symptoms in higher doses, but has more side effects. One was to say, please don't use complementary therapies or bioidentical therapies. Most women will try complementary. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Most people will use complementary therapies, but I advise them that if they don't achieve any satisfactory relief of their symptoms within six weeks, it's just a waste of money going on. Mm -hmm. uh, if they do get relief, that's terrific. I'm happy for them, but uh, we wouldn't recommend any prolonged use with them. All right. Uh, I don't, I'm very sorry, but I don't think we're going to get... Uh, this yeah. back somehow. So, so let me uh, do one thing, Rod. I'll ask um, the, the local groups in India to put forward their questions. Uh, may I ask Delhi first to uh, to ask the questions from the panel that is both uh, Rod and Chua. I need both of them on the screen. And may I request uh, Dr. Basu from Delhi to lead the discussion, please. Okay, I must congratulate you and uh, uh, you know, Rod Weber and Dr. Chua from the, for this wonderful session. And I must thank you. There are a few questions from the audience here. One of them is that uh, which form of HRT is to be prescribed in patients who are suffering from metabolic syndrome and dyslipidemia? Uh, my answer to that would be, uh, if they have a uterus, then you should be using a progestogen with minimal effect on metabolic disease, and that would be didrogesterone, uh, or possibly drospirinone, which is um, 
which is uh, anti, as you know, anti-androgenic and which counteracts some of the effects of estrogen on the renin angiotensin system. As far as the uh, estrogen itself is concerned, if you use a, a natural estrogen, then ideally you would use it uh, as a non-oral, but it would be okay to use oral therapy. The oral therapy will have a greater effect on cholesterol levels, but will slightly elevate triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, another question is that uh, somebody who's been perimenopausal and HRT was taken for four to five years, around 50 years of age. And is there a role of restarting HRT, say after 60 years, for improving quality of life? No, no. If, if they are still taking at the age of 60 and they need to take it for symptom relief, then I believe it's okay for them to continue. But if they stop at 50 or 55 even and then come back 5 to 10 years later, then I think the evidence we have is that it may do harm and they should not start again. Uh can we, I think we have that, this we have covered already in the lecture about the group of women who rapidly lose bone mass after menopause. What are the biomarkers which are being used or is there anything that we could use in India? Any suggestions? Identifying women who would have more bone loss at a more rapid rate. Now, I'm not sure if Dr. Chua is going to answer that. Dr. Chua could reply to that please. Do you, do, you, do you know which markers you have in India? Because I don't know which markers you have in India. Are they available, bone, bone yeah. formation or bone loss markers? Yes, yeah, some of them are available. So which you, you have? Is that, is that, is that, that commonly used, used in India? No, they are not very commonly used, hardly ever. And I think the only people who think that people normally use, not as bone markers, but they probably do a DEXA a scan or something like that. Nothing beyond that, really. Yeah, I agree with you. In Singapore, that's the case too, because uh, in Singapore, our bone markets are also very expensive to perform. And mm -hmm. there are also certain difficulties in performing them because the bone markets are relevant only if you do it at a certain time of the day. There are some fairly strict criteria about how, how to get them done. So, for example, I don't run clinic every single day from the morning to the afternoon. So, uh, if I were to run these bone markers, my patients would have to specifically come at a certain time. So I find it increasingly difficult to convince patients to do that too. So in Singapore, I also use bone density uh, as an assessment more so than the blood test. I think it's similar in India by the sounds of it. Yes. What about and, and, and in Australia, I might add, we usually just use bone density as a test. Yeah, it, it, it has been suggestion for use, and I think the re reports are quite positive in terms of hinting to us who are the rapid losers of bone density, but it hasn't quite caught on, I'm afraid. Okay, but thank you. Another question, you know, what about the safety of HRT in diabetics? Oh, it reduces, HRT reduces insulin resistance, so it's uh, completely safe. All you need to do is make sure that their, that their health is okay in other ways. But HRT reduces insulin resistance, and has a beneficial effect on lipids, so it's good. Uh, and uh, when you're putting people on, uh, your women on HRT, how do you follow them up and monitor them? I see them, um, unfortunately for me, I give them my phone number and tell them to ring me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're but, a great one. Yeah, or a fool. Uh, but I tell them to come and see me after three months and then we discuss how they're going and then usually once a year. Okay, are there any specific tests that you get done at these visits to follow them? No, not, no. Uh, look, uh, I think uh, in, in Australia we would do a bone density every two years, we would do a mammogram every two years, we would do a pap smear at the moment every two years but, but probably by next year every five years. Um, and so those visits I would use to check on their general health, uh, to check their lipids uh, if their family physician hadn't done so, but also to ask them if what I try to get them to do 
is to try coming off their hormones for a few weeks before they come to see me so that we can see if they actually need to continue or not. Because remember, the primary reason for using the hormones is alleviation of symptoms and improvement of well-being. And so that's what my intent is when I see them once a year. So Do what is that normal? Sorry, can I ask a question along that line? Do you believe in uh, titrating them off or just stopping? <laughs> That's going to be my next question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a great question. You know, the, I'll tell you what, the, 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 uh, uh, the Cochrane Review reply to that is there's no evidence that it makes any difference, but, I titrate, I, but I titrate them off. So do I. Makes sense, oh, doesn't it? It does. What it is the wrong? I think if you, stop it suddenly, if you stop it suddenly, they do get the symptoms back again. And I think yeah. the titrating helps. Them. But you see, uh, do, we do have our recommendations even from the Indian Menopause Society. Is there any difference between uh, what is being recommended by the International Menopause Society and what is recommended by the Indian Menopause Society or the APMF? I don't think there are too many changes in the recommendations. Is there anything else, uh, Dr. Chua, which you have come up with the recommendations which are different? Well, not since the global consensus statement in 2013. Our APMF um, statement, position statement, is about to get revamped, so we will be very much in line with the IMS uh, consensus statement and the global, global position statement from 2013 and the updated one in 2016. Right. We're about to get that revamped. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Jaydeep and Dr. Jyoti, uh, any uh, changes you feel we have in our IMS recommendations as compared to international? Since we have an, a large Indian audience, uh, whether we want to give them any suggestions? No, Dr. Duru, I think the recommendations are essentially the same. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, our 2013 recommendations are quite similar to what is... Uh, quite similar. Yeah, okay. So I think we need to follow similar guidelines and recommendations as uh, Dr. Baber has uh, already brought out. And there were, uh, we can go to the next city now. I think Delhi has asked quite a few questions. If there are from Chennai, can we go to Chennai? Uh, good evening, Dr. Guru. This is Dr. Guru from Chennai. Uh, there are a few questions from here. One is, uh, is does uh, hormone therapy improve the muscle weakness or does it add to the muscle strength? Hello. interrupted. Sorry. We're not yeah. able to get your voice clearly. Like, so it doesn't have any effect. Muscle strength. Uh, no, not clear. I think the sounds are breaking off again. So maybe, uh, can I, uh, uh, can you all hear what Dr. Professor Rod is saying? No, we are not able to hear. You want to try again, Rod? Can you hear me now? Yes. Much better? Yes, sir. Good, good. So you got the question, Rod? I got the question. The question was, does estrogen improve muscle mass or make it less? It doesn't have any effect on muscle mass. Uh, and the but other anabolics. question is, Yes, sir? Go on. Yeah. The other question is, uh, does the hormone therapy have any uh, impact on uh, SLE, in systemic lupus erythematosus? Can that be given or does it have any interaction in SLE? Well, SLE increases your risk of thrombosis of BTE. So mm -hmm. you would want to use the least, uh, the safest form of hormone therapy, but otherwise there's no reason why you couldn't use hormone therapy in a woman with SLE. I would just use, again, the lowest effective dose of, of estradiol or non-oral estrogen with didrogesterone or progesterone. Um, okay, thank you. And the other question is... Uh, What's, what would be your first line of management for the 
menopausal osteoporosis. Do you recommend hormone therapy or do you go for bisphosphonates or anything? That's Dr. Chua's question. <laughs> well, it certainly depends on the age group, but uh, the recommendation is that if the woman is before 60 and soon after menopause or in the perimenopause period, and there are also vasomotor symptoms, there are symptoms of menopause, then I certainly would recommend hormone therapy. I'm not sure what it is, uh, how it is like in India, but in Singapore, most of the common osteoporosis treatment options are rather expensive. None of them are supported by the government. Uh, we have bisphosphonates, we have, uh, we have uh, zoledronate, we have phosphio, we have the new um, prolia, but these are all very, very expensive medications to prescribe in Singapore. And certainly if the woman is, uh, is also having menopausal symptoms, I would much rather put them on hormone therapy. Uh, than to suggest one of the very expensive medications. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. And uh, just one more uh, about the androgens, the female. Do we have uh, separate kind of formulations or prescriptions for androgens in female? And uh, to Dr. Duru, is it available in, in India? Which one? Uh, any uh, specific formulations for androgens for female? And androgens. Only androgens? Yeah. Yes, androgens. Not for women. We don't have them in India. Okay. But probably the only other um, hormone therapy which you could sort of relate it to is a tibolone which partially gets metabolized into an androgenic metabolite. So you don't have testosterone creams in India? No, not yet. Um, they, they do have them for men, but not specifically for women. <laughs> you need to be careful with the dose. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, has Chennai uh, finished with their questions that yeah. we can go to yeah. right now? Uh, thank you, Dr. Duru, Dr. Dr. Thank, thank you. So can we go on to uh, Raipur? We have... Uh, Dr. Jyoti and Dr. Salini there. Any uh, questions from Raipur? Yes, ma'am. We have lots of questions, though some of them are already answered. Yes. One question is that which combination of HRT is preferred? CEE plus MPA, CEE plus Didrogestron, or CEE plus Micronized Progesterone? Which one is preferred? Um, if it was, that? Yeah, if it was me, I would uh, prescribe micronized progesterone or didrogesterone in favor of MPA. <clears throat> okay, in what doses, sir? I think you're still trying to find out what Duru is taking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we uh, start with a low dose estrogen like? Can we start with uh, 325 or lesser than that and then increase gradually? Yeah, yeah, absolutely Continue. right. You should. You should start with the lowest effective dose and that is yeah. probably around 25, yeah. So 0.3 of Premarin uh, or one milligram or even half a milligram of oral estradiol or a 25 microgram patch or indeed sometimes even less. And I still tell some of my patients they can cut the patch in half if they want to. For how many years of treatment with HRT is preferred to get the benefit of, specific benefit of HRT? Minimum how many years of treatment is required? Uh, well, they will get relief of menopausal symptoms within six weeks. And that's the main reason for prescribing hormones. And that, then you have to then wonder how long those symptoms will persist. And we know that for most women, they will not go for five years. But unfortunately, for 20 or 30%, they will go for 10 years or more. So some women will have to take them a long time just for that. As far as the bones are concerned, we have data from a lot of uh, both randomized trials, including WHI, and observational studies, which shows an improvement in bone density after at least one year. You can't really demonstrate much of a change in a shorter period of time because the sensitivity of the machines is such that 
you can't be sure that you're seeing a real change or just an artifact. Uh, so you don't need to take it for a long time is the short answer to get relief of those symptoms, nor to improve the bone. So uh, for the increase in the bone mineral density, how much time will be required to at least to be taken uh, the MHD? At least one year. Like Prof. Weber said, um, you should do the density test only alternate years, and that's what we normally suggest. Um, I typically do a BMD at the start of uh, the start of that, and then monitor on a two yearly basis, no less actually, because it's not sensitive enough to pick it up. So it's no point doing a BMD every year. So I normally, if I start a patient uh, perimenopause with hormone therapy. I would plan it out that we, we should continue this for at least two years. We would see okay. definite improvement in vasomotor symptoms. We might see if osteoporosis was a part of the indication that we would see a response in two years. And in terms of the symptoms, they don't usually last a lifetime for most people. So I would make a tentative plan for them to start titrating after at about three to four years and aim to stop treatment before five. So that's my general game plan. Okay. Uh, if we have the obese patients, so uh, should we alter the dose of estrogen and progesterone in such cases? In cases of the obese patients, if high BMI patients are there, so if there is alteration in the uh, standard doses or uh, we should give the standard doses only? You should give the dose that alleviates their symptoms. That's the most important thing. Um, so I know that people who are overweight have more risks of all sorts of things, thrombosis, everything except uh, osteoporosis, really, probably. <laughs> but they're certainly at risk of metabolic disease, and they're certainly at risk of, of, of thrombosis. So for those reasons, we don't want to give them too much hormone. And you'll note in the guidelines... The recommendations say if you're obese, you should really try and use non-oral therapy to avoid some of those risks. Otherwise, the key thing is to give the lowest dose which effectively relieves the symptoms. I can think I we'd like to uh, move to Baroda now since we are running out of time. If you don't Daru, mind. can I just ask Rod a question? Yes, sure. Rod, do you have experience with using oral estrogen with the levonorgestrel impregnated IUCD? I do, yes, we use it quite a lot. Um, in Australia, we're very fortunate because it's on the subsidised medicine scheme, so okay. we, can prescribe, we can prescribe that uh, levonorgestrel IUD and it costs about $35 and lasts for, as you know, oh, five wow. years. So the it's next great. Next time I'm in Sydney, I'm going shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy them cheaper in India too. <laughs> Well, also so, in India, I'll go shopping. Yeah. I, <laughs> think, I think it's quite a good idea. So let's move to Vadodara now. We have Dr. Sushma Bakshi and Dr. Maitri Shah there. Uh, any questions? About three questions totally, please. So we can't hear you. Are you able to hear us now? Hello? It's too muffled. Your voice is too muffled. HRT in CA breast survivors lack uh, safety data, but for BRCA careers, many of them they undergo prophylactic uh, uh, 
hysterectomy with bilateral salpingoflectomy. So can we start HRT for them for prevention of osteoporosis? Yes. The RCA career, sir. Yes. Yes, you can. The evidence is very clear. This, it's safe to use. After prophylactic surgery, it's safe to use. And indeed, if you start hormone therapy in prophylactic, sorry, in women who have still not had their breasts removed but have those genetic mutations, the risk is increased, but no more than it would be for any other woman. In other words, the relative risk might go up to about 1.2 after seven years. But if women have had prophylactic risk reduction surgery, such as removal of the breasts and the ovaries, you could certainly give them hormone replacement therapy. And in fact, it's been shown not to cause any increased risk and to improve their quality of life and longevity. Yeah, thank you, sir. In, in this uh, women who are having had their hysterectomy, you would be giving estrogen only therapy anyway. Yeah, you would, yeah, yeah, you yeah. would. That's right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, next question is whether uh, hormone therapy can be used for perimenopausal depression as a mainstay therapy? Uh, well, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, there's a man in England called John Studd who I spent two years working <laughs> for. And John Studd would say, yes, you could. Uh, but John's, uh, I think it's very difficult to justify because we don't have any evidence. And the, there, is, uh, there is the paper published uh, in Climacteric, which is called What Comes to Mind? And it's a very thorough systematic review of the use of hormone therapy for all sorts of depressions, cognitive function and Alzheimer's disease. Victor Henderson is, the lead, is not the first author, the last author. It's called What Comes to Mind. And it's a very thorough evaluation which shows, unfortunately, that for perimenopausal depression, estrogens are not terribly effective. Well, on the other hand, if they have depression clinically um, and also vasomotor symptoms, SSRI and SNRI are effective for both. Yeah, that's that correct. That would be a better choice. So, any more uh, questions? The last question. Uh, if a patient is asymptomatic uh, with her menopause, is it necessary to give HRT? No. No? That was two no's. No. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much, Varodhra. We will go to Pune now. That's the last city here. And we have Dr. Shubhada from Pune. May we request you to give your questions, please? Pune? Is Pune there or left? Uh, there is one patient, one of the question is, there is one patient who is on anticoagulant for very long time. She has got a very strong family history of CA breast in her two sisters. And on anticoagulant, she is of course high risk for osteoporosis. And now she's landed up with uh, hot. So what, what will be the choice of What will be the choice of drug for this patient? Anticoagulant. Does she, does she have hot flashes? Yeah, she's come for hot flashes. Well, I think you should use all the non non hormonal options first. So you should try to treat her vasomotor symptoms with other things, including the SNRIs, the SSRIs, or even GABA, uh, because you will be on your own if you give her hormones. If you give her hormones, she's got a family history of breast cancer. She's, she's on anticoagulants, I presume, because she's either had a DVT or has a thrombophilia, and so it will be very difficult to give her hormones. If she came to me and had exhausted every other opportunity, then I would give her non-oral estrogen therapy in the lowest possible dose with micronized progesterone. Okay. Um, the other question I think already answered how long a term. Uh, there's one more question. What happens uh, after you stop HRT? Suppose you started uh, HRT for osteoporosis because the woman is very high risk. 
but the evidence says that once you stop hrt say after 2 years 3 years the bmd goes down very fast again within next few years so how do you counsel this women and what happens to their bmd after you stop hrt yes. um, look i think she Ch- Ch- should answer this it's her baby yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is very true. Uh, after stopping HRT for two years, the BMD will start to start, uh, will start to drop, and the fracture risk will increase. So you've essentially delayed uh, the rapid loss phase uh, that leads to osteoporosis. So as I mentioned in the lectures, in the ideal world, we are doing a lot right at the beginning of life to prevent, not only to struggle to prevent this uh, around menopause. So what we are doing with the hormone therapy is merely to delay it seems. Okay. Uh and uh, last question uh given a choice if both the things are available will you choose CEE or beta estradiol which which is the better molecule to use? CEE or estradiol. Uh my 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 preference is for estradiol. Uh I'm afraid I'm uh, perhaps we're being a bit unkind to see because it was the one used in WHI and so and 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 in Australia there are a lot of women who will not use CEE because it comes from horses and they feel it's being unkind to the horses uh, so <laughs> I, I prefer to use microdosed estradiol okay <laughs> thank you so much i think I'll go the horses. Okay, i think yeah I well, think they get the dial because he is no longer available in Singapore. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, there you go. It's really hard to find it. Yeah. Anyway, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for being here, especially our speakers, uh, uh Professor Rod Babber from Sydney and uh, Dr. Chua from Singapore and our invited experts uh, Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Malhotra and Dr. Jyoti Uni, all our moderators who have been moderating in the five cities, all the delegates who have been on the web and who have been sending in a few questions. I thank all of them for being with us today, and I also uh, thank Pfizer for having supported this through an educational grant and helping International Menopause Society to take the education uh, forward. which we would like to take further and further and we look forward to having another uh, program on the 25th of june which will be on sexual dysfunction in uh, postmenopausal women and uh, we'll get back to you once the details are out and send you the link and uh, i would like to thank all of you again for being with us thank you bye bye thank you thank you